always afraid Roman's going to sue me for something. This freaking guy over here. Um, Not for recording. Oh, is this, is this, uh, okay, video pause. Huh. Well, it, it says it's to, being recorded. It does, it does. It was, it was pausing for two seconds, but let's see. Okay. It's Let recording me, um, or transcribing. Beautiful. So I'm going to close down as many other things as I can just to triple check and simplify our kind of bandwidth needs here together. Okay. Two seconds and then I'll, uh, all right. Uh, see what I can shut down here on my side just just in case there's any way to speed up video by half a half a second um, okay all right I think we're in a good spot so uh, it's rolling again we're the, the formal audio is not yet popping I'm going to get my podcast recording going can I do a quick audio check for both you guys? Roman, if you don't mind saying maybe like your favorite flavor of ice cream. I love vanilla ice cream. Just really love it. Wow. He's a he's a plain guy. He's a plain guy. Rocco, how about yourself? Uh, paperclip flavor. Oh, oh sorry. Delicious. Sorry. Chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. chocolate. <laughs> my bad. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> my God. I... Uh, yeah, no, no, we didn't get that part. You're fine. Nobody's gonna know. Nobody's gonna know that you like that delicious paperclip flavor. All right. Um. So, gentlemen, here's what we'll do. Uh, when, just so you both know, I'm gonna record a separate introduction to this episode, um, which will introduce both of you guys, introduce the topic, and it'll be very professional and nice. I do that after the episode. I do that for two reasons. It's gonna save you five minutes, get you back to work, or you know, dying of heat, or whatever you're doing. Um, and second, it's going to let me highlight the most interesting parts of the episode uh, in the intro. So and that, I can't do that until we actually record it. So so that's why I do that after. So when we actually do start, hopefully Rocco can still hear me. When we actually do start, I'll do a simple, I'll get him in here. So when we start rolling, I'm just going to, it's all good. We're going to record the introduction after Rocco. So I'm going to do a simple five, four, three, two, one countdown. I'll welcome you guys onto the show. You can both say hi, at which point I'm going to kind of introduce the audience to the format and I'll pass things right over to Roman. It's going to be really quick and smooth. We're going to go right into the meat and potatoes of things and we'll have fun with it. The way, the way these conversations go, whether I'm talking to the fucking head of AI at Raytheon or you guys who are like a pal, um, it's just, it's just like two people sipping coffee, talking about shit they're interested in. That's literally it. So um, it, it'll, it'll be a very, very flowy, simple combo. Roman and I actually just did this in person a couple weeks ago. So, uh, we've already been in this mode a little bit here. So let me do this guys. I'll do my five, four, three, two, one. I'll welcome you both. And then I'll, I'll pass the mic over to Mr. Roman and I will keep us running on time here with my timer. So here we go. <laughs> and a five, a four, a three, two, one. So gentlemen, uh, Mr. Rocco, Mr. Roman, welcome to the show. Glad to have you both here. Thanks, yes, uh, it has been quite some time since we've had multiple folks on the podcast at once. And I think it may be many, many years, in fact, since we've had a kind of debate like topic uh, over the last couple of years, the AI risk conversation, particularly since ChatGPT has started to become uh, a much bigger deal. And we have two sides of the coin to look at. So our listeners here, we're going to kind of summarize uh, both points. Roman is going to be arguing in the side of AI's inherent uncontrollability. Rocco is going to talk about how we might be able to control post-human artificial intelligence. We're going to take about eight minutes and unpack both positions, make it fun, and then uh, we'll be able to discuss them kind of across the table with both folks. So Roman, we're going to start with you. You can kick off with as much of a monologue as you want, and then you and I can kind of unpack it together. But give us kind of the quick version. You've written, you know, a dozen damn papers about this topic. Why is it that you suspect artificial general intelligence is inherently uncontrollable? Give us your summary here. Right. So I'm specifically talking about future superintelligence, not AIs we have today, not the next uh, GPT modification, but a system which by definition is smarter than all of us in all domains. Uh, we're now maybe a decade into AI safety being a field of research with universities, publications, conferences, 
so far no one has published anything or proof or even a rigorous philosophical argumentation for why they think the problem whatever they call it alignment safety friendly doesn't matter is actually solvable so from theoretical point of view there is uh, not much out there from practical point of view i'm also not aware of anyone claiming that they have a solution which is likely to scale to any level of intelligence super intelligence and such so i was interested in what's going on there i tried to find all the blogs all the posts there is nothing formal. People share their intuitions and they are very convinced that, of course, it's trivially solvable or no, absolutely not. But no one is doing any formal work on that. So I wanted to fill in a blank there. I started looking at what is likely the tool set we would need to control something like that, to control super intelligence. And there are properties we would want to have. We want to explain how it works, explain the neural network. We want to be able to predict certain capabilities, behaviors of that system, not just terminal goals, but what are the instrumental goals it will have. Uh, so predictability of decisions by a smarter system. We need to be able to verify if the code generated matches the design of the system. We need to be able to communicate with it uh, in a non-ambiguous way. Human languages are very ambiguous. Uh, we ended up with about 50 different impossibility results, which we surveyed. And we published about a dozen papers and individual ones and a more general all encompassing survey paper on all of them just got accepted to a very good uh, journal of uh, computing surveys. So it, it seems to be that for everything. Can I just, I just interrupt, which is that the uh, impossibility results in AI a survey, uh, Brzezic and Jampolski? You got it. Yeah, ACM computing okay. surveys just yeah. accepted yeah. it. Yes. So we are at the point where uh, it seems like uh, for the tools we expect uh, to need them, there are limitations on how well those tools will work for us or what tools we can even have. So obviously you can explain something about those systems. Obviously you can predict certain behaviors, but uh, I think the main difference between kind of cybersecurity and super intelligence risk safety is that in cybersecurity, you get to try again. You give them a new password, you reissue credit card, and no big deal. Whereas with X risk, my assumption is you only get one chance. You have to get it right the first time. And if all your tools are additively flawed, then overall, it's unlikely that you'll get it right the first try or really ever, because we're not creating a static safety system. We're creating this perpetual safety machine and just like with perpetual motion devices lots of papers published lots of books even some patents but we know we're never going to succeed it's just impossible and that's my claim and i would love to be proven wrong if i walk out of this debate with uh, conviction that we can definitely control super intelligent godlike machines of the future is a successful package all right got it can i can i poke into this with you here we've got another four minutes or so roman on your side so um, a few things. I think there are some people who are uh, hopeful that you will be proven wrong um, so that you know humanity can sort of maintain their position at the top of the food chain forever. There's maybe some people who hope that your your position remains the case so that capabilities can expand well beyond people. But regardless, so let's try to crunch in the position itself. You mentioned kind of an analogy here, this idea of a perpetual motion machine, um, you know, where it's it's supposed to sort of never need any new uh, inputs into the system in order to sort of move forever. We know it's inherently going to fail. That's a bit of an analogy for why, you know, AI safety might fail. Other analogies I see people bandy about are ideas like, okay, let's presume you're a rodent. Um, is it ever possible for you to predict the behaviors of a, a human being? Um, you know, is, is that is that reasonable? Is it reasonable to suspect that you're going to control them, that they're going to be sort of under your command? Again, another rough analogy. Is there a way to get tighter to sort of science rigor logic than these analogies or or is the analogy a lot of where a lot of this sits on for you i mean how do you how do you go at the people who really want to get as rigorous and logical as they can here well that's what i'm trying to do in papers i publish so explainability for example you can talk about different classes of machines we have basic automata which may not even have memory states we have machines with memory. We have different uh, types of machines, uh, up to Turing complete, hypercomputation. And we know that a lower level machine is incapable of doing certain things a more advanced machine can do. That's the whole point of different complexity classes. So you can show that, okay, for 
human being with uh, given memory, with given speed of compute, or even for humanity taken as a whole, there are upper limits to what we can understand. It, it is obviously true for average humans, right? We give exams for admission to MIT because we know not everyone's going to do well in a quantum computing class. But uh, even for people with IQs of 200, uh, there are upper limits to what they can understand. For humanity as a whole, I suspect there are limits uh, purely mathematically. There are problems complex enough to where may maybe you don't have enough time to survey the proof, maybe some other limitations, but there are upper limits. Are those relevant uh, in terms of complexity of understanding behavior of really large language models? Maybe it hasn't been studied enough. Intuitively, I think there are obviously upper limits to what I can comprehend. A lot of times I face a situation where it's just beyond me. It's not a general limitation, but in many specific domains. So why are we thinking that we're never going to hit that level of uh, upper complexity when it comes to understanding AI? Let me know if this is an okay way to congeal what you're framing. And I want to make sure I'm putting this in a proper nutshell before we pass the microphone here. The idea is that um, you know, and I think this is a, this seems, this particular part of the argument seems very cogent. There are ideas that we either don't have the time to unpack as human beings, uh, or they're simply outside of our cognitive grasp, right? There is no way for me to explain to a Labrador retriever, you know, a very, uh, the, the, the deeper meaning of Emerson's essays, right? There's just no way for me to articulate it or to explain the workings of communism versus capitalism, right? It's just not going to happen. Um, and so similarly, we can expect outside of the human skull, there are many such ideas that are ungraspable. Is your supposition, Roman, that a machine that can grasp these outer bounds of entire, you know, imagination spaces that we don't have, this would permit it to break free of any constraints, to gain domains of freedom that we can't even comprehend, and to find its way kind of out of any bounding box. Is, is this part of the argument, or would you frame it differently before we pass over the mic? So the problem, the problem of control of alignment is too complex. We cannot talk about it. We haven't formalized it or defined it. So I want to break it up into capabilities, such as can you understand how the system works? And then for each individual capability or tool in my toolbox, I want to show that there are limits. So one, we kind of agreeing there are systems we cannot explain how they work or comprehend how they work. Check. Let's see what other properties we may hit in a similar way. Because it's hard to talk about something so complex as a unified whole. Of course. And we can imagine that enumerating the capability space of a human. Like, what are what are Roman's capabilities, right? If I was going to create a checklist, that feels pretty likely to be incomplete. And now if we're talking about a system beyond humans, it also feels pretty unlikely to be complete. Okay. Eight minutes, 20 seconds. We're going to give uh, Rocco exactly the same. Rocco, my good sir, um, why don't we pass it over to you? You can start with as much of a monologue as you'd like the the nutshell here without directly responding to roman because we're going to get into that just laying out your position why do you suspect that something vastly post-human in its capabilities uh will be controllable go ahead brother well actually that's not my position so my, my okay. position my position is simply that we don't know um i think roman is underestimating just how young the field is and his expectations are just a little bit too high so you know, like that. There are some, there are some mature fields in contemporary science, such as let's say physics. Right, physics is a mature field. You know a lot about physics. What is water? What? What? Literally, what is water? You, you want me to answer? Yeah, yeah. Jeez. Like, I mean, what is it? I, I, water i mean water would be a molecule water which would be one? a combination specific. of specific elements yeah i mean hydrogen water, and oxygen which, H, h2o right yeah 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 yep yeah sure so go on you know unfortunately and another thing right what is the temperature that water boils at in degrees celsius at standard ordinary room pressure Lay it on me, brother. Over well, in America, I mean, we, 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 we measure, me. we measure. I would guess about a hundred. A hundred, right? It's a hundred, right? Um, but can you prove that without doing an experiment? Prove that water boils at a hundred degrees C. Just from the without definition of water, you can't do any experiments. You just have to use the definition of water 
an oxygen atom bonded to two hydrogens, you get the Schrodinger equation, you get a supercomputer. Can you prove that it boils at 100 degrees C at standard pressure? And I believe the answer, as of 2023, is that if you do the calculation, you can't get it right. It's like 60. It comes out completely wrong. Right? Okay. So it's 2023, and we cannot prove the temperature that water boils at. <laughs> An experiment that any random person can do in their own living room with a thermometer and a kettle and confirm that it boils at 100. But that is beyond okay. the state of the art, right? In physics, physics, I'm not talking about sociology or computer science or any of these. I'm talking about the most settled science that humans know, physics. We cannot prove what temperature water boils at. I think our expectations are a little bit too high at the moment for what we should be able to prove. And, and I, I believe that's correct. I've, I've, I've searched around a little bit, um, but I believe that using ab initio methods, just using quantum mechanics, we are not currently able to work out what temperature water boils at. So, you know, we're going to try and work out whether we can, like, control a super intelligence. Purely theoretically, you know, I mean, it is clearly a much more complicated problem. Um, so we have to lower our expectations, right? We are a civilization which doesn't know what temperature water boils at. We have to go and look, right? Um, you know, I actually think it is very important at this stage to massively open one's mind to the possibilities and just go and do the work, do the experiments, and 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 sort of see what happens, right? Um, now obviously, <laughs> obviously, such a process of experimentation and research is going to itself incur a certain amount of danger because you would have a sort of lab leak. Um, but nevertheless, I think that's what we actually have to do, especially now that the level of hardware we have is relatively manageable compared to the, you know, if you just sort of do a count of how many transistors there are in the, on the planet compared to how many synapses, the transistors haven't yet uh, become more numerous than synapses. So we can probably do some experimentation now, and, and that's why I'm in favor of a halt on hardware progress right now. So we just stop Moore's law, stop producing more powerful systems, and just just play around with ideas. Another thing, right? You know, in in the past, there have been temporarily very bright stars in the sky, right? Um, you know, temporarily a single star will outshine uh, the whole sky. Now we now know that this is a supernova, right? Now we do know kind of strange, we do know roughly what causes a supernova, right? Um, basically, what happens is there's a sort of burning process which creates pressure, the star runs out of hydrogen fuel, that burning process stops, and then the thing is allowed to sort of collapse in on itself uh, and consume a bunch of gravitational potential energy. There's then a collision in the center which then causes the thing to basically blow up. That's a huge oversimplification of a multi-field sort of problem which involves temperatures and nuclear reactions and electromagnetic fields and gravity and all of these different forces. But we kind of know how supernovae work. We've categorized and we have, you know, the type 1, the type 2A, type 2B. We've sort of done that. Now, how many researcher years did it take to build up not just the knowledge specifically of supernovae, but also all of the supporting physics, the general relativity, nuclear physics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? I mean, it's quite a lot, right? I and, mean, you know, I think it's something like uh, 10,000 researchers working for a number of decades is, is a sort of order of magnitude, um, you know, for, for how much effort it takes to develop not just the specific theory, but the supporting infrastructure as well. Um, and, and, I, and it's sort of a little bit arbitrary where you cut it off. How much of mathematics do you include in that? But, you know, you kind of want to have 10,000 researchers for 10 years before you can really say that you've kind of like given a top quality human uh, effort into a field. And we are nowhere near that on AI life. Nowhere near it. We're, we're, we're probably like 100 researchers for, for like five years, right? 
being mindful, yeah. we've only got two minutes here, Rocco. We've only got sure. two left on your core position. No, I mean, we're that, gonna, that's we're basically gonna... my piece. That's basically my piece. No, that's fine. We just that's fine. Have to accept that we are only one or two percent of the way through exploring this field right now. That that said, look, just to clarify your position before we continue here, um, I can see where you're coming from. Uh, you know, the idea that simply knowing. Uh, you know, simply looking at the laws of physics or at molecules themselves, we cannot get to this, the, the sense of when water actually boils. Now, the... Right. the Which seems pretty uh, simple, one, right? What, no, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. Now, here's what I would say, though, and, and I want you to correct me just because I want to make sure the audience is following both arguments. I hear you say that, and I say, wow, that sounds like a great argument for Roman in some way, because if, if we really, if we pay a lot of attention to a space. You talk about man hours. I mean, how many man hours have ever been spent on physics at that kind of a basic level, right? Experimentation at that kind of a basic level. If we still can't predict what goes on, what would lead us to believe that there would be a greater predictability for a system vastly post-human? For right. me, it, it feels like the number of well, man hours might not right, square yeah, that yeah, circle. Yeah, yeah. Let, let, clarify your position here, please. Right. But, but here's, here's the thing. Although we don't know, we don't even know what temperature water boils at until we actually go and look at it. You know, we can, we, that, that's fine. We, we can just sort of skim over that uncertainty and uh, go and measure it. And we go and measure a whole bunch of things, do a whole bunch of engineering, and we can build, you know, incredibly intricate uh, thermodynamic machines, power plants, chemical processes. Uh, we can build all sorts of things, right? But we have to concentrate. So Perhaps the way I can put this is you don't have to know everything about the universe in order to control it, right? So we can we can control water very well. You have a water supply in your home. Water is used in the power plant that provides your electricity. Um, you know, water is used in the chemical industry that makes your food and your toiletries and stuff like that, right? Despite the fact that there are still some very fundamental gaps in our knowledge, like why does water boil at 100 rather than 60, right? And various other problems that, that we just can't work out. So um, an engineering mindset that's solution-oriented and that sort of roots around uncertainty can achieve things that are many orders of magnitude, many, many orders of magnitude of complexity higher than a sort of physics-based attitude where you're like, okay, we literally have to understand everything. From Got it. To, to just do a final nut shelling and then we'll keep the, the ball rolling. I do appreciate the clarification. Um, your suspicion here, you know, is that yes, we don't need to understand absolutely everything to have a practical grasp of it. Why do you believe it is practically graspable that assuming we pause hardware progress, you know, nobody continues to to blow up Moore's law. I mean, that's mm -hmm. going to be a tough supposition. This is this is not a global governance chat. We're just talking about the hypothetical controllability. But assuming such a thing is possible, um, why? What makes you think that within ten years we could control something that has these capability spaces as far outside of our skull as we have outside of a cricket? What what makes you believe that there would be a kind of stable ability to control such a such a system, even if we had all those man hours? What what is your core reasoning for that? And let me let me kind of wrap. Yeah, up well, I, I actually would just say that I don't know. So you know, maybe we should just be very naive and go 50-50. There are some examples of um, systems where a, a more simple system could control a more complex system, such as, for example, uh, you know, you, you could say that like a a gene is a very simple system that controls a human, and people go through all of these elaborate plans throughout their lives. But really, it's all just to, uh, you know, basically reproduce, right? Uh, everything we do is, and 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 that's not perfect because we, as Elias Yudkowsky points out, we invent things like condoms and the contraceptive pill. But nevertheless, we do still reproduce somewhat, right? And and so like it's a bit, it would be a bit weird to think that a very simple system like just a few genes can exert you know, partial control over a very complex system like a human, and yet a human can't exert any control at all over a more complex system. So there are obviously examples in reality, you know, the gene to the human, the humans to the society, the government to the military, the, the child to the mother. There are all sorts of examples of simpler systems controlling more complex systems. So, you know, I mean, there is like a priori some hope that 
precedent. We sure. control more from this. Got but it. We're yeah, very I, early, I get we're very early. We, we certainly are, and you, you've made that point clear. I do think that, the, you know, the gene control in the human sort of ideas is interesting. I, I think also that there is an argument here that the genes have bubbled up and the genes have shredded violently through billions of forms to arrive at you and your opposable goddamn thumbs, and that mm -hmm. it may shred through many, many other forms, and it may not be like this this stable thing built to, to make hominids uh, uh, mm -hmm. sort of the top of the food chain forever. Regardless, yeah. let me pause here. I'm going to have Roman... Uh, take a kind of pointer at Rocco's core arguments. You've gotten a chance for him to kind of put his stuff in a, a nutshell here, Roman. Let's pick a pillar and kind of respectfully lay out either what you want to clarify about it or kind of dissemble about it. And then we'll let you guys build off of that. But Roman, the floor is yours to kind of to say what you believe is kind of the crux of where, you know, your disagreement with Rocco stands here. So I, I think the main conclusion was Rocco says he doesn't know. And I can respect that. I can be agnostic about it. And that's my whole point. I want non-zero resources allocated to determining if this is solvable or not. So far, it's been me. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a couple other people. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Can actually decide the future Close. of the universe. Close. So uh, I yeah. want some reproducibility. I want to be proven wrong. I'll be very happy with it. The analogies you bring up, I, I think they're not perfect. So you're saying, yes, we can control water. True, but water has a Q of about zero, give or take. Uh, yes, uh, genes can influence your behavior but they don't control it fully. That's why we use condoms. That's why abortion exists. That's why Europeans and Asians are dying out. So it's not the level of control we need, as I said, where we need to get it right without errors on the first time. You can certainly influence those systems. You can certainly do some good work in terms of understanding how they work, in terms of predicting future states, I have a new paper coming out, have not released it on our ability to monitor training runs, monitor deployment of those systems. Also seems like there are problems. Uh, I think Eliezer, you brought him up, talks about there are no fire alarms for AGI, which also makes sense. A lot of things we have today, 30 years ago, people would just assume it's a full-blown AGI, but nothing really changed in our world. So things uh, like that, uh, something to address. Um, I don't have background in physics, so I cannot agree or disagree with your claims about whatever we can determine boiling point of random liquids and given pressure. I would suspect it should be possible with good understanding. I don't think it's a fundamental impossibility in physics, but I never took a physics course in my life. So that's kind of putting me in a position. I, 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 think, it's, I think it's correct. Um, and it's sort of surprising that just plain water is, is enough complexity that you can't predict the boiling point just from an ab initio quantum mechanical calculation. Right. Right. I also think, depending on units we use, I think Celsius is kind of designed to be zero at freezing and 100 at boiling, whereas other systems are kind of randomly assigning. Oh, the, the, um, units, the units don't matter, right? Like, it, it doesn't matter what the units are. I, I agree. I'm just saying, like, this miracle of why did it end up being 100? How did it go? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. The, the reason, the reason it's 100, yeah, the reason it's 100 is because people went out and measured it, measured that water boils at this particular point, and then they said, okay, we'll set that to be the the um, the 100, and then they said, oh, okay, it freezes at this point, we'll set that to be zero. But the point is, we, you know, from an ab initio quantum mechanical calculation, as far as I'm aware, and I've looked it up, and I, I feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, we cannot predict what the boiling point of water at standard uh, temperature pressure is. Even pure, pure water, you know, uh, with, with a pure nitrogen gas, I, I don't think it's, it's predictable. We'll uh, assign it as the homework to the listeners. I think yeah, that's yeah. a yeah, sure, way sure. to do it. Yeah, they can, they can. But, uh, uh, the point is, if somebody published a paper saying it's impossible to theoretically determine boiling point of liquids, that would be an awesome paper. And I would love to see. It well, that, like that's it. not possible, though. That, that, as far as I know, is not possible because it's literally just the Schrodinger equation, right? It's just the Schrodinger equation with a lot of particles. You quickly get a combinatorial explosion. But, it, but it's obviously possible. It's obviously computable, right? Because there's just some algorithm that you can run that will answer this question. It's just very, very intractable. But I think in safety, the problem is not limited by compute. If we had hypothetical infinite compute, we still wouldn't know how to do yes. friendly this, AI, right? Yes. So it's a very this, different this a very, This is a very good point, actually, which I'm glad you brought up. Probably 
Marcus Hutter, Jurgen Schmidt Huber, and that crowd who led to Shane Legg, which led to DeepMind, which led to the situation we're in now. They we know who to blame. We have a chain of blame. That's excellent. Chain of blame that goes back to Schmidt Huber and Hutter. But you see, Schmidt Huber and Hutter's problem back in the late 1990s and the early 2000s was that they realized that even though the AI field had been going for like, you know, 30 or 40 years, even given a hypercomputer, even given infinite compute, there still wasn't an algorithm for superintelligence. And then Huta came up with AIXI, or AIXI, um, which actually was an algorithm for superintelligence given infinite compute. Um, now, it didn't lead to an actually practical implementation, but it was a very interesting theoretical tool to prove that you actually could generate superintelligence. It was theoretically possible. And you're very correct that if I give you a hypercomputer and I say you have access to infinite compute, you still can't solve the friendly AI problem, which is pretty bad. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a you know, like, it's not like there's an algorithm, but it's, you know, sort of exponential time complexity. It's like, no, there's no algorithm, even with hypercomputation. We have absolutely no idea. So, but I do, I do just think it's, a, it's, it's an artifact of being early in the field, we've, we've only probably done, you know, 1% of the AI alignment research that we're going to need to do. A lot of it's going to have to be empirical, but there are going to have to probably be theoretical, you know, significant theoretical progress as well. Um, and I, I don't know what it's going to look like. Um, I, you know, personally, I think the most fruitful director research, what I would like to do, um, is, is more on the empirical side because we have huge amounts of empirical data about human civilization and you know how it's progressed and how the values and axiology of civilization have changed um that i think you could do a huge amount of, of, of good things with if you could just sort of subject them to um, analysis with modern ai nobody's done that um you know that there isn't really a dynamics of axiology field right there isn't really even a sort of, um, you know, asking hypothetical questions about history. Like, here's, here's a good one. What could you have done in 1913 to prevent the First World War? Right? We don't have an answer to that question. Nobody's even trying to answer it. Um, and that's a really important question because it's sort of foundational to our civilization. And yet nobody, nobody knows. So historians are not able to answer counterfactuals, um, which, is, which is a pretty um a pretty bad state of affairs i think so yeah i mean i i would i would like to go on the empirical side but there is going to be theoretical progress as well i i, I for me uh, rocco to be frank um i'll pass this back to roman here but if, if we can't if we can't look at the rules of physics and determine what temperature water boils at then i think drinking in history books in the form of text or pictures you know in the form of whatever scanning you know black and white photographs um i'm not sure if we're going to get to the ground truth of the grand dynamics of power and the interworkings of the world from that from that either it seems somewhat self-evident that we wouldn't be able to pull that off i want to pass it to roman in this format and try to congeal here roman rock has got this position that with enough of this crunching on kind of the grand scales and these tighter things we could go from the one percent of ai risk that we've done to a greater percent and maybe maintain this kind of human kingdom for a significantly longer period of time. You quite obviously do not believe that that's the case. Even if we could pause hardware, et cetera, kinds of progress, uh, Roman, you seem to be in the belief that, frankly, the maintenance, so long as we have super intelligence, the maintenance of our predominance is very, very precarious and maybe necessarily doomed. C can you articulate why? Rocco's laid out why, hey, if we give, give us more time, there might be some controllability here. What's the main argument against that, please? So let me make maybe a controversial statement. Uh, Rocco is saying this is a very young field, AI safety, maybe a decade old. But if you look at history of AI, the very first paper in 1940s was about neural networks, artificial neural networks, Macau and Pets. Then for like 50 years, we did random walk and looked at awesome things. And 10 years later, we got back neural networks, deep learning. And the last 10 years, we had AI progress. I don't want to dismiss anyone's lifetime of achievement, but it seems like the whole field is 10 years old, right? And yeah. it's the same amount of time we have for safety. Whereas 
in AI, we went from nothing to we have AGI, essentially proto-AGI, and in safety, we went to we discovered a billion ways not to build AI safely. We keep yeah. zooming in, finding more problems. It's a fractal nature. Every paper with a solution is a toy solution with explanation that it doesn't scale, and every week we see a new problem. We've been trying to survey those. We, we stopped. There are so many survey papers now just listing ways it will fail. So I think it's not just the amount of time. Uh, we just had this letter calling for six more months to do research. Nothing's going to be discovered in those six months. It's not the time frame we're looking for. We need to have steady progress. Now with scalability, we know there is steady progress in terms of capability research. Add more compute, add more data, you get more capable system. There is not an equivalent progress in safety work. Mr. Rocco. Yeah, well, that, that was quite a funny dig at AI research. So there, I think there are, there are sort of two important reasons for the you know, wasting uh, sort of 40 years of AI research. Reason number one is that people didn't absorb Richard Sutton's bitter lesson. So the bitter lesson, for those who don't know it, is basically that theoretically elegant methods that aim to sort of custom engineer how a mind works will probably fail. But what will probably work is, you know, simple uh, systems that just try to operate. Right? So let me let me draw that distinction. So you could have a system where somebody very carefully engineers the knowledge management system for an AI's mind and how it's going to do inference and what rules of logic it's going to use and stuff like that. Do lots and lots of intricate sort of work. It looks a lot like software engineering, right? And people basically tried that for quite a long time. Uh, all of the logic-based approaches to artificial intelligence, the semantic web, which I sort of worked on in, in the late 2000s, um, you know, there was like psych, like a whole bunch of approaches to AI were based upon humans sort of understanding, um, well, not just understanding, but humans sort of designing everything uh, the way you would design like a theme park or an airplane, right? And the, the what Richard Sutton said is the, the ways that are actually going to work are going to be more like, um, you know, sort of like growing a tree. Right? You just sort of like plant the seed and water and it just sort of grows, right? And that's kind of, so it's a little, maybe a little bit oversimplified, but that's kind of what has actually worked. So one problem we had is we just didn't get, and he calls this, right, he calls this the bitter lesson. It's kind of bitter because AI researchers love to think that they're going to understand how intelligence works because they're like hyper intelligent and competent. But actually, you just shouldn't bother. You should just sort of give it an objective and uh, and water it with lots of optimization power and it'll just sort of work. Um, and, uh, you know, Jan LeCun is super famous uh, for doing this. And, and, and basically, you know, what actually happened is um, like, like, you know, you put loads and loads of, of sort of effort into very fine tuned specific vision systems. And Jan LeCun came along with like convolutional networks. And convolution is not exactly that complicated, right? It's just kind of what you do in, in Photoshop, basically. And critically, they had the idea of back propagation. So, you know, very simple operations plus back propagation, water it with lots of optimization power, and then the thing is just like really, really powerful. So we didn't get the bitter lesson. And the second problem is we just, even if you had understood the bitter lesson in 1956, you just didn't have the raw compute power to make use of it, right? So, you know, we were spinning our wheels for a long time, waiting for solid state physics to actually create a sufficiently powerful machine. There we have it. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think we, we actually sort of shouldn't count a lot of that time. And it, even, even worse than that, right? Even worse. There was a period after the AI winter in like the late 70s where the rate of improvement of, you know, computing in cost per dollar was like exactly counteracted by the rate of degradation of how much money people were giving to AI research, right? So like the actual amount of compute an AI researcher had was like constant from like 1980 to 2000. And so there was like not that much progress. And then suddenly, you know, various dams sort of broke all at the same time. 
AI researchers were given more money, and there was like all of this catch-up work in more war, and there was GPUs, which is sort of power, you know, specialized power, etc. So, you know, compute hardware is like a pretty big deal, um, and I, I think with better hardware, we will be able to explore the field of alignment, right? We'll 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 be able to do huge amounts of exploration, right? Just just massive amounts of progress uh in you know, but it'll it'll take like a decade or something, I think. Maybe two, maybe three, I don't know. Um but but I think we will be in a better situation after we have say you know two decades of work exploring alignment, controllability, axiology, that kind of thing, um than we are now. <coughs> Let me, let me try to slide this around the table a little bit here. So what, what you seem to be articulating, Rocco, this idea of the bitter lesson, which rings rather true. I mean, it, it's, it seems to me like if we think about the economy, right, the bitter lesson for economists might be you're not going to model the economy on a napkin. Like you're, you're just not going to do it. You're gonna, it's going to do its thing. And, and so, so with AI, we're talking about the same thing. And, and so what, what this, appears to, this appears to me to be it's – this is this is the fecundity of nature, right? This is this is things rattling forth and becoming other things. Deal with it. You're just not going to bottle it up. That general tenet and principle does not make me feel more secure about controlling post-human intelligence. That makes me feel as though the rattling forth will rattle well beyond us. You're, you seem to be articulating that the rattling forth will lead to a good structure to control the rattling. I, I think the grand dynamic of this rattling of the of the grand fecundity of kind of nature and intelligent things might bode poorly for control but you seem to be saying hey if we if we expand you know this space of control you know kind of uh, and, and test and experiment you know like a tree we grow it it'll it'll build you know a forest of good control versus a forest well beyond our comprehension I, I'm almost hearing an argument that seems counter to, to where you came from but please clarify if I'm missing a boat here well I mean you know if you're if you just let the whole thing go and do its own thing, if you just sort of say, okay, everyone controls all of the AI chips and go and do whatever you want, then I think it's pretty much guaranteed that that will lead to human extinction. Like, I don't know exactly what the end will look like, but I think it's pretty much guaranteed that we're dead. However, if you say, look, we're going to pause hardware for a bit, we're going to give the safety research and the alignment research, and we don't, we don't have to control everyone else's software work, they can still go and do stuff, but we just, don't allow massive further leaps forwards in hardware from where we are today. We let the alignment researchers work for you know two years, five years, whatever, do some experiments and work out where we actually are. And those experiments, you know, you can run many, many, many experiments and see what actually happens. If we take an AI of this form, we take a, a, a model of society of this form, and we let it let it out, what actually happens, right? Um, we need to run those experiments and see what happens. And then once, as we're running those experiments, we're also going to have better ways to actually control the system. So you have me mechanistic interpretability, you have constitutional AI, and there's going to be a whole raft of other ideas that come out that will make AI systems more controllable and, and more aligned, right? And then we can go and test them. So I think, th think about it like this, right? If you're a farmer, you can go plant a whole bunch of different crops, test them, see what works, and then selectively breed the best ones, and just keep doing that until you have the perfect crops, right? And, and it is actually possible, and farmers have done this, to, to make in, incredible progress in, in the yield, and also control the weeds, right? Controlling the weeds is kind of like the farmer's alignment problem, and they, they, they do that. They have, fertilizer, they have pesticides, and they have uh, mechanical weeds, and now, now they even have uh, AI systems that will do the weeding for them, that will sort of like identify the weeds and shoot them with a with an infrared laser. So, you know, yes, you absolutely can maximize the yield, minimize the weeds, you absolutely can do a lot, but we actually need to put the effort in, right? We, we are at the stage where I believe you know, anything is possible if we actually try. Okay, uh, Roman. I, I have one other. I have a final question. I'm going to put on the table. But Roman, let me pass it back to you. Rocco's laid out. Hey, if we get enough runway, even if we have this kind of post-human AI, so long as hardware is bound, we should be able to work on this and then be able to really sustain kind of this human top of the the food chain ball game. Does that seem reasonable to you, Roman, or do you have any last things to put on on the table against that with regards to, to Rocco's argument? 
So, so first, hardware is already out there, right? We sold quite a few processors for crypto mining and for uh, AI training, and the algorithms are becoming more efficient. I hear people train a model which is not so different from top of a state of the art in one day for hundred dollars in a laptop with the gpu so controls of additional hardware would not impact something like that another problem is the difference in amount of time required for training versus testing and debugging if you train a model for six months i don't think you can test it properly in six months you need like 10x that maybe six years will get you to where you like really looked at all the edge cases and Edge cases work really well for narrow systems, right? If you're a general system, there are no edges. It works in all domains. It does cross domain, multimodal. So you're not even sure what to test for. It has capabilities outside of human domain of generality. It has emergent phenomena, which you don't know to test for until you somehow encounter those unknown unknowns. GPT-4 is very likely right now to have capabilities we haven't discovered, simply because we haven't looked for them. It used to be, and I think Roku kind of alluded to that, uh, AI was software engineering. We engineered those systems, we understood them, it was beautiful. Now it's computer science, truly. It's science, we run an experiment and we see what happens. We don't know ahead of time, we discover new things. It's like studying those artificial organisms. It's a subset of biology now. So quite a few changes, which for me at least make it sound like the problem is even harder in all those regards. Got it. Um, let me, I'll put, so that the listeners can kind of decide where they sit here in terms of the relative tractability. I see the the merits on both sides. I'm going to maybe end on what for some people would be, uh, you know, a light note. I think that there are some folks who are tuned in whose deepest desire is the eternal human kingdom. I think there's other people tuned in whose deepest desire is the grand blooming of intelligence itself across the galaxy, even if that's in vastly post-human forms. I won't say which side of the coin I'm on, but let's assume um, that sustaining our position at the top of the food chain is a priority at least for quite some time. And maybe in a best of all worlds from you know maybe Rocco's standpoint here, assuming this is controllable, Rocco, do you presume, and I'll pass this to Roman as we close out, do you presume that such a controllability structure, assuming we had, again, the hardware freeze and the time to work on it, would that keep us going at the top of the food chain for a hundred years? Would it be vastly longer than that? What do you think might be the best case scenario, assuming this stuff could work out well in your definition of well? Um, well, what, what do you mean by us, though? Do you mean like the literal biological human form? Sure, we can talk about hominids as such, but if you want to extend beyond that, by all means. Yeah, I mean, I think this sort of does get to the heart of the of the problem, which is um, <clears throat> axiology. You know, what we value um, isn't the same as literal, you know, flesh and blood, right? So, if you had a, a robot that you could sort of um, incrementally transform yourself into, uh, that was made out of metal and silicon and whatever. Um, but you know that that robot that you can sort of incrementally replace yourself with is is better from the point of view of the things that you care about. Um, then you know that the literal biological flesh would be gone, but the things you care about would still be there. So the way that you think, the way you relate to people, the way you feel, and then you could also be immortal, and you could also upgrade your level of intelligence, and you could do all sorts of cool things, right? So. Um, I think it's better to think about the evolution of values rather than the evolution of materials like meat versus silicon, right? So yeah. the, the, the real question is the evolution of values. So, uh, you know, I believe that immortal axiology is possible. I believe it is possible to lock in our current values forever and then we can just spend the rest of the universe uh, exploring the uh, the logical consequences of our current values. So if you currently value, um, you know, your own subjective experience, you can just go and explore that at higher and higher and higher levels forever. Now, if we fail to lock that in, then we will have mortal axiology. Our values will eventually be deleted and replaced with something else like a paperclip maximizer or, you know, something weird like that. Um, but I think, I think immortal axiology is possible.
Got it. So, it, well, and, and I think there is an argument here too that our world would be drastically worse if the axiology of crickets was frozen in time all the way through the evolution of humans, like much, much worse universe. And I think we might argue that a vastly post-human super intelligence should, should be able to explore the state space of values in addition to the state space of, of ideas. But to your point, maybe well, let's no, just assume I, that I, human I, values. I know, I know you do. I know you do. And that's fine. So, so we're going to articulate your, so this is a point of, of slight contention here, but I'm going to try to step step out of the ring myself and keep this to you guys. Your, your point in terms of where we could get is not that we would maintain the flesh forever, but you would say, Dan, if we could freeze hardware, if we could really work on safety, we would have enough time to work on the bubbling up and evolution of our own form to really populate the galaxy with something pretty well connected to what we care about. And for you, that would be really the grand win here. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. It would basically Beautiful. be okay, wonderful. possible uh, utility. I think that's a very reasonable long-term supposition. You and I have our own separate side conversations about that, but I, I, I will say I think that's quite reasonable. Roman, for you, you know, the the consummate pessimist. Uh, your your memes make me know at least I'll laugh when we get consumed by AI if it happens. But let's just assume that doesn't happen in the next five years. Um, for you, what would be a win? You know, let's say we have non-zero uh, efforts being put towards maybe the prevention of AGI or or maybe AGI safety. I know you're not big on believing AGI safety would work. What could be the win here? You know, knowing where the world is headed, uh, Rocco's laid out his. Is there one you would want to move towards in terms of a, a beneficial future here? So the win I hope for is that all the top researchers read my papers and for purely personal self-interest decide not to create general superintelligence. They kind of do what DeepMind does where they have very narrow superintelligences solving important problems like protein folding, giving us immortality, giving us other very beneficial things without risking everything for no reason whatsoever. What uh, uh, Roku is envisioning, uh, I think it's kind of a flavor of coherent extrapolated volition or something like that. Uh, the problem is if you take a squirrel and upload it and upgrade it to where it's as smart as a human, it's awesome, but the squirrel is dead. There is no more squirrel. You will not be you if you are different intelligence, different biology. Uh, I always make this joke about, yeah, my wife can find like some other guy who's taller and hotter, but it's not a win for me, right? Like this is not no, what not. I want. A lot of computers. Oh, I, 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 I disagree in some ways. So you know, I I don't think biology is actually really much uh, of a part of our axiology, right? Like if if you know, if you take a person, right, who doesn't know much about science, and you you just sort of ask them, you know, are you made of proteins? They'll be like, what, like protein shakes? No, I'm not made of proteins, right? Like pe people don't actually know that they're made out of protein. So we don't actually care about that, right? Um, you know, as, as far as I'm concerned, this finger could be like rubber. I don't care, right? Like I really don't care that it's made of cells. So you, you could just sort of get rid of the cells, um, get rid of all of that stuff. And as long as my, uh, as long as my computational input outputs that I actually do care about, like what I can see, what I can feel, uh, what I can do, what I can think, as long as that's preserved, you can replace the, the proteins with, you know, vulcanized rubber and steel. It doesn't matter, right? So a lot of people would argue that uh, there is a hybrid solution. We can kind of merge with uh, AI and you'll have this uh, brain computer interface and implant. But what I think they fail to realize is that you have nothing to contribute to superintelligence. Long term, you will be removed from that hybrid, either explicitly or implicitly, because again, the system is doing just fine without you, you're just a biological bottleneck. So that's also yeah, yeah. not a I, I, I agree with this. I think the people who are talking about merge, humans merging with superintelligence uh, just don't know what they're talking about. You don't want to merge with oh. superintelligence. You want to use superintelligence as a tool to create an immortal axiology for yourself, right? So, so well, if the let's let Roman let's let, Ro, let, let, Ro, let's let Roman paint his, his ideal future. So I think yours is pretty clear here, Rocco, in terms of where you stand. And actually, I'm quite congenial to many of your ideas. But I think Roman, we're, we're painting sort of where do we want to land hypothetically if this went well? Rocco, I get where you're coming from. I want to be able to wrap on on where where Roman said it. Roman, I'm going to try to nutshell you, and I want to make sure you can clarify for me. Um, for you, hey, let's get narrow superintelligence to work on important problems for humans. And because we will be eviscerated, and for you, this is a violation of your values, maybe not Rocco's, but yours. 
um, we should maintain our biological form for as long as we can stave off. So some kind of, let's call it a Butlerian jihad for general intelligence, and we'll keep them narrow. And we improve our ability to flourish and our economics and our, you know, uh, human kind of hominid flesh and blood human populations for as long as we can with all these wonderful technologies. Is this indeed the grand future that for you would be the closest thing to a win? Uh, or am I misarticulating from it? So this is reasonable. I want to preserve options. I want to make sure all of us get to do what we want. If Rocco wants to upload and improve and non become non-biological, it's definitely his option. Uh, I want to have uh, an option of staying close to the original form. A lot of computer science, especially computer science ethics, is about removing bias from algorithms, race bias, gender bias. AI safety is all about placing bias, a very strong pro-human bias back into those systems. And we know there are proven results showing you cannot remove all bias. And I think for similar but kind of inverse reasons, there are limits to how much bias you can introduce into a system without making it completely dependent. If you want generality, you want creativity, you're not fully controlling it. If you're fully controlling it, you're sacrificing capability. And that's the trade-off we have. So uh, the conclusion for me is uh, I, I want to preserve those options. I want an undo button and I want all the benefits uh, short term, but bias as much time as needed to figure out what is going on. If we want to move to that next level, I published a paper where uh, at the time, again, it was pure science fiction. Now with Meta doing virtual reality, Apple jumping into it, the idea of virtual worlds is becoming more and more kind of mainstream. Let's give everyone a virtual world of their own. And in that world, you can do what you want. It's your fantasy. We just have to control the substrate. We don't need to solve the multi-agent value alignment. I don't have to sacrifice my values. It's beautiful. Let's build that. All right, I like it. Guys, we're gonna have to wrap on that note. I like that we've painted kind of the ideal destination for both of you. Roman has this idea of potentially being like a piping clover where the higher intelligences permit him to be what he wants to be uh, by their own grace and goodness. I don't know if every higher intelligence will permit such a thing, but I am sure that if Rocco upgrades himself, Roman, he'll treat you pretty well. I think, I think he'll still be your pal, even if he turns into some kind of wild Rocco robot. So gentlemen, this has been great to be able to unpack both your positions and our, our far future. Thank you both so much for being here. Appreciate Thank you. It. I just hope he puts me on a white list of humans who will not be tortured by AI forever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. That is, uh, where are we? I think it was 56 minutes on the dot, guys. So we did, uh, we, we, we did great, gentlemen. We did great. Um, and I think there, the video. Let me stop. Let me stop the audio and make sure it's all saved somewhere meaningful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's definitely do that. Show and folder. Let me. Okay, it's called recording. How creative. Uh, let's move it here, and we'll call yeah. it Ben Rocco. Okay, okay. Now I have it. This and what's the size of that thing? So let me give me, so, give me one second here. I'm gonna oh, actually. So I'm gonna create a Google. Google. That's nothing. That's a baby. No, no, it's it's okay. tiny. It's tiny. So let me let me do this, guys. Uh, I'm going to create a Google Drive. I'm going to put it in the chat, and if you could both just pop your your raw audio in there, that would be great. Um, I'm going to just uh, make sure that this pops up, and I'm going to figure out where the Google Drive video recording went. I know the video got a little bit choppy in and out here, but we'll see where that uh, that file landed itself. I'm going to create a Google Drive. And I'm going to give you guys both this link. And if you could, we will just pop your raw audios into this majigger. And you put your so, video recording in the same folder? Um, I will. I think it's going to be saved to some kind of Google Meet Drive somewhere. It's It was kind of popping in and out for both of you guys, the, the video actually recording part. But we're going to see where that lands. Um, so okay my file is up all right fantastic um rocco if you wouldn't mind just chucking yours up there as well that would be great um and then i will do the same with my uh with my audio once i've i've got it out of my recorder here so we should be can, in you, both, uh, can you still hear us okay, rocco? yeah you're all fine with uh, me sharing that video yeah 
I'm cool with it. I've just got to figure out where the hell these files get saved to because I, I literally haven't recorded directly from, from me forever. So um, I'm going to have to do my own Googling on that side. But once your file is uploading, it's 25% complete. The size of the file okay, is easy enough, easy enough, guys. I'm going to be uh, diving back into the old email inbox here, gentlemen, but I appreciate you both being on board. I'll keep you both abreast of where the hell the video lands. Maybe I'm still at the coffee shop here, so I'll figure out where this thing is. Um, otherwise, I'll also keep you guys posted on, on when I'm hoping to get this thing out live and published. Um, but I'm glad that we got to get in a little bit of a nerdy conversation this weekend, gentlemen. Thank you both for being here, right? What, what do you what? estimate as the time until it's released? How long before you put it up? Um, ballpark a little bit under a month. Okay. With all the sponsor wanna, stuff we Before GPT-5, right? Before Singularity. Yeah. It, yeah. it, might, it might try and expedite it because timelines are actually quite fast right now. A month is a long time. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's up to you, but, but I would have. Uh, all of this I is secondary to paying it. my bills, gentlemen. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> run things based on who's who's fucking paying me, right? That's how the game works. So yeah, let's let's all understand that. So um, I'm going to uh, you know I'll figure out. It's probably gonna be a Thursday or Friday when this goes out, um, where we have inventory and we can spare and. You know, I'm not taking away from somebody that's trying to pay me. So um, that'll be that'll be that, guys. I'll keep you both abreast of where it's at. Roman, I got rid of the original tweet. I'm sure we'll get some other fun stuff up once this episode is up. But, gents, it's been a real blast. I'm super – I really like the ending of the episode. I think people are going to learn a lot from this. So you guys have a great rest of the weekend, okay? All right. Thanks, Thanks for I'll catch up soon, guys. guys. Appreciate it. Stay in touch.